the COVID pandemic has changed a lot of things. And uh, one of the things it changed was this. Um, I would like to introduce um, Arul to the audience um, so that we get started with the first presentation. I think a lot of people in the audience know Arul already because of his work that he's been doing in Cyprus at the public hospitals and especially Magarios Hospital. Um, Arul is a, a professor of uh, obstetrics and gynecology uh, at the University of Nicosia and he's, was, uh, also, he's also professor emeritus at St. George's University of London. Um, he's been an obstetrician and gynecologist for about 40 years and he's been teaching uh, medical students but also um, students from other backgrounds uh, for, for uh, 25 years now. And in Cyprus, I think he has made a big impact with his work that he's been doing with the, uh, with the professional associations in trying to improve maternal care and child care uh, on the island. So we're very uh, glad and honored that he has, uh, he has accepted our invitation to make a presentation today at this seminar. And uh, we thank you, Farul, for your ongoing support. Uh, you never say no to us, and we very much appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Urania. Thank you. And thank you, Alison and Nikros, for having me here. So my talk is going to be uh, about respectful care, but also I'll bring some technical issues so that we can really look at what is the medical community doing to bring about obstetric care. So I'm going to start with a slide presentation. Uh, and here I'm going to the full screen in a minute. Okay. So I think about valid information, Alison is going to cover a lot on that area. So I will be sticking myself to maternity care and what we can learn. As you can see from the first picture, uh, there's a lady in labor and she's being accompanied by her partner or husband giving all the emotional and physical support needed. That is very important. First, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Dame Tina Lavender, who kindly helped me with this presentation and also declaration of interest. I, am, uh, I do a lot of things, but in addition, I also support some medical software companies with ideas and shares and so on and so forth. So what is uh, respectful maternity care? So the care organized for and provided to all women in a manner that maintains their dignity, privacy, confidentiality, ensures freedom from harm and mistreatment, enables informed choice and provide continuous support during labor and childbirth. Now, although these uh, indicators are there, how do we monitor there's dignity, privacy, confidentiality, and continuous support during labor and childbirth? So the World Health Organization has been working a lot on this issue, so I will take a few lessons from the World Health Organization. This is their chart about intrapartum guidelines. There will be antenatal care. I hope Alison will be covering quite a lot on that. And the respectful care means it should be woman-centered. And there are a number of aspects, emotional support from a companion of choice, effective communication by staff, pain relief strategies, not only by the companion, but by the staff, regular monitoring and documentation of events and feedback to the woman who is in labor, oral fluids and flu food intake, and the companion can assist in this. Mobility in labor and birth position of choice. So let her walk around, lie down in whatever position. Pre-established referral pain, plan for pain relief and other matters, and continue to your care which leads to respectful labor and childcare. So this is a number of items put together, but the center is the woman and the child who is going to be born soon. So this is a document by the World Health Organization. We say it's a human right. So women have a right to positive childbirth experience that includes respect and dignity, a companion of choice, clear communication by maternity staff, pain relief strategy and mobility in labor and birth position of choice. So that is, this is the basic minimum five, which has to be there to call it respectful care. Now I'll take one or two as example. Why do we need a companion of choice? 
first of all, to be the advocate for the mother, because once the staff sees the woman or the mother, they go away. And if the mother needs something, somebody has to go and tell the staff, look here, this is what my uh, daughter or my wife needs. So they become advocates. If they want something to drink, something to eat, so they can go and approach the staff. Or if the staff forgets to review them as planned in three to four hours, then they can go and uh, remind them. So advocate for the mother is a great asset if you have a companion. The second is actually to allay anxiety and provide reassurance because you know, if the companion is not there, the mother is in a room and maybe there are no windows, she will be very anxious as to what is happening, who is going to come next, etc. So companion can give the emotional reassurance. To provide hydration and nutrition because it's quite important when she's in labor, she can't go in and out. Somebody has to provide her with hydration and nutrition. To provide non-medical means of pain relief, it might be massage in the back and music, aromatherapy, and to request for medical means of pain relief. If she wants more relief, then she can go and ask the staff. And to provide information on progress. So she can discuss with the staff, how is it progressing and what to expect. And to act as a liaison between mother and relatives because the pregnant mother's mother or somebody else might want to know what is happening, whether the baby is born, the staff won't have time to answer. So if the companion is there, he or she can take over the responsibility. And that is a great asset of having a companion of choice. Now, the Cochrane, which is the, the medical community, looks at Cochrane database to look at the evidence. And this is the evidence to support continuous companion during childbirth. So it says it may improve the outcomes of women and infants. It'll increase the spontaneous vaginal birth, shortens the duration of labor, decreases cesarean section birth, decreases instrumental delivery, and decreases use of analgesia, including regional anesthesia, and the improves the outcome for the baby. So there is a, a positive spin if there is a companion. The outcomes are always better. There is no evidence of harms of continuous labor support. So there is no ill or harm, harmful effects by having a companion. Now, there are people who look at subgroup analysis. What about this, that, but you have to um, interpret it with caution because the numbers which are looked at are not enough. So the evidence suggests continuous support with certain provident characteristics. Say, if it is in a, a hospital setting, there's not enough uh, staff, there is a middle income country setting. It is more so important uh, to have a favorable impact by having a companion. So wherever there is lack of staff, lack of uh, uh, equipment, lack of things, having a companion helps a lot. And future research to focus on longer term outcomes, like it increases mother infant interaction, postpartum depression, it reduces it improve self-esteem and so on. So there are other benefits, tangible benefits by having a companion because the negative feeling during labor is overcome by having a companion. Now, if you look at the literature, why are we really clamoring about respectful maternal maternity care? Well, it has been discussed over many years, but um, nothing has changed in many countries and many labor watch settings because everybody is busy because they are shortage of staff. They just do their business and go out. So this is a summary of 65 studies across 34 countries. They said there is physical, sexual, verbal abuse when there is no companion, no support. There is stigma and discrimination. The younger mothers who are not educated, those who are lower in the professional rank, they don't get the proper care. So failure to meet professional standards of care is the major thing and poor rapport between women and providers. So there are lots of dysfunction and constraints without a companion and continuous support in labor and respectful care. So here I'm taking up one of the good papers from the Lancet, how women are treated during facility-based childbirth in four countries. And what they did was to ask the woman about the various aspects of respectful care. These are the findings. These studies were done in Ghana, Guinea, Nigeria, Myanmar, and more than a third of women experienced mistreatment. 
and women particularly vulnerable around the time of birth they are very anxious they don't know what is going to happen whether she will be alive she'll be well what about the baby and so forth so and more so when they were younger and less educated they had more of this suggesting in inequalities in how women are treated during childbirth so every woman whether she is young or old whether she is poor or rich has to be treated alike with respect and dignity so there is a lot of research on reciprocal care if you are interested um, there are some papers which are analyzed by Sue Dunn of his reciprocal care in Lancaster who showed that the None demonstrate clinical outcomes or evidence of sustainability of interventions. So, in other words, if there are limitations in care, then outcome is very poor. And uh, I won't go into evidence anymore. I will finally zone into four points, which will improve respectful care, being free from harm and mistreatment. Maintaining privacy and confidentiality, preserving women's dignity so she's kept covered all the time, people are not walking in and out of the door, open the door and keep it. Prospective provision of information, seeking of informed If you want to do something, have a good discussion, ensuring continuous activity and community support. Enhancing of physical and mental resources, so it should be kept clean. And if you want a ball or a, a facility is available for a water bottle that is wide, providing equitable and uh, engaging with effective communication. So it should be not midwife or doctor in and out, but stay there, hold the hand, and answer all the questions. And respect women's choices that strengthen their capabilities to be an availability of competent and integrated human resources. So, in some hospitals, they have a good many in which they can answer after the labor and delivery as to how satisfied they are with the facilities and care And continuity of care is important. So, a midwife or doctor continuously provided the care rather than four or five people taking intermittent care. So why is respectful care important? Because this respectful care negatively impacts on childhood experience. It deters women from attending facilities. In many countries, they don't like to do childbirth because of good respectful care. Increase in near miss mortality because they wait at home in the last minute and there's a complication to go to the hospital. And why the implications of society and community? So we had to give respectful care for women to keep life into the hospital. And this is where I think we cover about knowing their own information and clinical classes. All this will matter because they have anxiety and they know what to ask. Now, I will finish with what WHO is doing to improve respectful care. They did a project called the Pole Project and they got information from the women and what they wanted in one place. And this is respectful care, good communication, labor companion, essential physical resources for them to have a good birth and action on information system, actionable information system, like how do they plot the pulse, blood pressure, temperature, the progress of labor, and not put it retrospectively, but prospectively should be available. And uh, they also did systematic review and the answer from women, they want to have positive childbirth experience that fulfills or exceeds their more personal sociocultural belief. This includes giving birth to a healthy baby in clinically and psychologically person one. So how is WHO trying to achieve this? Well, they are doing some based projects I will share with that very quickly. This is a graph called Heart Graph, where they plot the cervical dilatation of the 
valves and blood pressure and so forth uh, on the trough. But there is nothing about companion, nothing about feeding, nothing about the respectful care. So they are going to change that into what we call labor care guide. This looks complex. Great morning. The first column is about identification and admission of the victim. Number two is the most important one, supportive care. So there is what is called as alert. As you could see, companion, and posture. So every half an hour or one hour, the wife can talk whether there's a companion, or not. If it is not, then to advocate, to call and get a companion in. What about the pain relief? What about oral fluid? What about posture? Now, these items were in the earlier part of that. This is actually about supportive care. The rest of it is about labor management, monitoring the baby, monitoring the mother like before. So that the mother by looking at the child. So the child is not big, but it is very possible for the woman and the partner to see what is happening to the cause, blood pressure, temperature, and so forth. And about progress of labor, that is also liberalized because before Pfizer, then more insurance support. And if they are facing can give up to six months for them to continue in labor. So a lot of uh, things have been added to labor can die, and finally the birth outcome. So in other words, the medical community through the WHO is working very hard to bring about respectful care, but also not forgetting the most important aspects of it. So I'd like to thank you for the kind opportunity given to me. Perhaps it was a bit rushed, but I'm sure uh, Rainy, I might make the slides available for you to have a review. Thank you very much indeed. It's on mute. Yes. All right. Thank you very much, Arul, for this very interesting and informative presentation. We've been talking about respectful maternity care all morning, and we've been gathering. Um, we've been doing a little bit of brainstorming in a workshop earlier with uh, our midwives here and uh, other health professionals who participated in the conference this morning to think about what the barriers they're, ba the barriers they're facing in our hospitals in Cyprus to, uh, uh, in, in the context of respectful maternity um, care. The, um, of course, the um, aspect of information, informed choices, and communication between uh, parents and providers were at the core of those discussions this morning, especially because uh, Baby Buddy is at the heart of this uh, uh, conference this morning. And we would like to thank you again for uh, the honor of putting it all in the wider context of respectful maternity care and presenting uh, the evidence uh, from the literature. There might be time for a couple of questions or uh, we might wait until the end. Um, I don't know whether you're gonna be with us until yeah, the end of the I'll session. Wait till the end. I'll wait till Alison finishes. And sure. Yeah. I think it's probably best to do it this way then. We'll move on with our second keynote speaker. And then, please, any questions you may have, we're going to have both our speakers at the end of the session uh, to answer questions. So I would like to uh, introduce our second keynote speaker, um, Alison Baum. Where do I start? Do I read the bio that I have in front of me or do I just say that it's such a pity we haven't got Alison in, in the room. Alison for the Cypriot baby body team was uh, simply an inspiration all these years. Uh, of course, baby body Cyprus wouldn't exist uh, without baby body. As we've been saying uh, since uh, morning, we are very fortunate that uh, Erasmus Plus has funded this uh, project 
uh, this strategic partnership with Best Beginnings uh, UK to internationalize Baby Body. I'm sure Alison will, will uh, explain what difference Baby Body uh, makes and all the work they uh, do in the uh, UK. For us, it was such an honor, as I said, uh, to be the first international location that we would do this um, um, partnership to try and see whether one digital resource that was created within a specific healthcare system with specific needs could be could make um, could be used and be as useful here as it has been in the uh, in the UK. And of course, in the morning session, we went through the process by which we made sure working with the local uh, scientific uh, organizations and body to ensure that all the information in Baby Buddy, all the new information that we included in Baby Buddy is vetted, uh, is valid, is based on evidence and best practice, the same way that Best Beginnings work in the UK to uh, develop their digital resources. So, um, Alison, Wonderful. you've been such an inspiration for us. And um, what else shall I say? The floor is yours. Lovely, lovely. Well, it's um, it's been an incredible journey working with you all. Um, I don't know if you all saw um, a gentleman just bring me a cup of tea. That's my um, husband, who's a professor of pediatrics, but also with the joys of home working, things like that happen on, on the, uh, during conferences and, and Facebook lives. Um, so it's such a pleasure um, to be here. I want to check you can all see my slides now. Yes. Brilliant. Um, and to be able to follow Aral, as you'll discover in this uh, presentation, Aral and I go back a long way and it comes back to this key idea of collaboration to drive change. Um, so um, I don't know why my slides aren't progressing in the way they normally would. So this is interesting and slightly confusing. This has never happened. Um, I will try and click stop on the share. And click on the mouse and see. You can see, can you see my slides moving or not? No, it's, it's not. Okay. We're uh, no. Um, oh. Sorry, it was just the title slide. Yes. Maybe you can try sharing again. Okay, I'm going to try sharing again and see if we can get this show on the road. Um, right. Here we go. Can you see this now? Still the title slide. Yes. Yep. We Here we go. Slide. Okay, so before I talk about Baby Buddy UK and Baby Buddy Cyprus and what we're doing together and why this is such an important day for me and all of the team at Best Beginnings, I wanted to set the scene a little bit about Best Beginnings as the charity that created Baby Buddy. We exist as an organization to give every child the best start with a particular focus on informing parents and professionals, not just informing, but empowering parents and professionals and supporting them to work together so that together we can improve outcomes and crucially reduce inequalities. Um, each country has their own issues around inequalities in outcomes. Um, I won't dwell so very long on this slide. You'll know more about the Cypriot situation. For example, you have particular issues around access to um, uh, natural birth and, and other kind of aspects of different communities having poorer outcomes. Um, but it says there's something quite powerful about data and being aware of inequalities that can galvanize and motivate individuals and teams to shift things together. Um, at the charity, everything that we do focuses from what we call this window of opportunity. All the evidence tells us 
that the foundations for a healthy and happy life are laid in this window from preconception to the fifth birthday. And the reality is early intervention is good and earlier is better. So as a charity, we've been going since 2006, but we haven't ever gone beyond the first year. That's changing next year. That's a, 2000, uh, a 2021 endeavor. But for now, we focus mostly around the perinatal period because we know the significant impact it can have on the mother, on the family, and vitally on the child. And we, from the beginning, have had these guiding principles that have underpinned everything we've done over these last 14 years. And that's around innovation. It's about using film, it's using technology, whatever it really takes to inform, empower, I guess, and inspire change. And crucially, evidence, working from it and contributing to it. And I'll be sharing some data with you a little bit later. I'd say our most important guiding principle is the one bang in the middle of this slide, and that's collaboration, the power of driving change together. And that's why I'm just so grateful to Nikos and to Veronica and all the team at Birth Forward and the paediatricians and all the multidisciplinary colleagues we've had the pleasure of working with at Best Beginnings to bring us to today. And following on from what Nikos said, special thank you also to our funders, the Erasmus Plus programme of the European Union. Um, there is, within our approach at Best Beginnings, a theoretical underpinning. A lot of that is around supporting positive behaviour change, whether it's uh, giving mum the confidence to take actions over her health and well-being, or thinking about system change within a health service. And the theory of uh, theories and models we've used over the years have shifted as the evidence has changed. But for a number of years, we've been using an approach uh, from a team at UCL, which really uh, um, focuses on the capability, the opportunity and the motivation and how when you bring things together, positive change can happen. There are many aspects to that. Um, and here are just a few. And they are all closely linked. You know, if you have a traumatic birth experience that will impact detrimentally on your mental health. If you have anxiety antenatally, that can affect your birth experience and so on and so on. Um, so what we do in the midst of all of this is create tools and baby buddy is, I guess, our, our key tool um, that are designed to support parents and support professionals and support change. But we don't create them in a vacuum, me and my team at Best Beginnings, creating something and putting it out into the world. One of our kind of uh, approaches, a theoretical underpinning of everything that we do is embracing the power of collaboration. So Baby Buddy, like the other resources we've created over the world, was created initially in the UK as a resource, then in the UK, integrated into our health system and continues to do so and constantly we're evaluating and sharing and learning. Now we did this approach long before apps were even a thing. DVDs were of the day and I just wanted to take a moment to note our first resource that the charity uh, launched and that was back 10 years ago in 2010 and that was uh, a DVD call from bump to breastfeeding. Now, for those of you that have already looked at and played with Baby Buddy, you'll see there are a lot of breastfeeding films within the DVD. And those films originally, or most of them, sorry, they're in the app and they're on your web. You have the web version in the UK, we've got a phone version, and originally it was on a DVD. But at the heart of it, it's films. Films of parents sharing their stories and films of experts guiding and giving evidence. And the breastfeeding films that you have on the Baby uh, Buddy Cypress web app, many of them are from this Bump to Breastfeeding DVD. Why am I telling you this? Why focusing so much on that? Well, life is a journey, and I'm going to be taking you back in time quite a long way through this talk to tell you a little bit about the motivation for me personally. Um, 
and to note key moments along the way. And what I need to tell you is every resource that the charity has launched over the years has been launched in London at the Royal College of Obstetrics and Gynaecology. And the first of those resources was Bump to Breastfeeding. And it was Aral, who at the time was president of the Royal College of, Obstetric, of, of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists who launched from Bump to Breastfeeding. So it's just an honor and a privilege 10 years on to be part of an event that's launching Baby Buddy Cyprus with Aral once again. And Aral in his talk, talk spoke a lot about the care and the importance of, uh, of, of partners and uh, the relational aspects and um, what a vital role you as professionals can pay, play and also birthing partners. What I want to, I guess, emphasize throughout all the kind of this, what I'm about to say now is across all of the talk. Baby Buddy as a web app for Cyprus and here in the UK as a phone app is a powerful tool, but it's not a magic wand. There are no magic wands. It's there to augment and amplify to what already is being provided. It's there to directly empower and inform parents and to directly support you in your uh, knowledge and in the contact points you have with parents. So I'll be revisiting that idea, but it's very much a resource to support what the great work you do. Um, and that's why I'm so pleased to be here launching Baby Buddy Cyprus with you. Now, going back in time, I was mentioning some of the theoretical underpinnings. The charity was founded 2006, and in 2010, this really important uh, policy document, it's called the Marmot Review, was launched in the UK. And just this year, they launched the 10 years on. So I'm very much in a reflective space. I think there is something about COVID and the pandemic and the challenges of the world. Maybe it's making many of us take stock and think about the journey that we're on and the journey we're going on. Well, for me, the Marmot Review was pivotal. Uh, firstly, uh, and, and delightfully for Best Beginnings as a charity that for four years had been focusing on the early years, um, the Marmot Review highlighted the importance of the early years. And for you as many midwives and people from midwifery teams in the room, highlighted the importance of maternity services and parenting programs in the early years to really reduce inequalities. So that irrespective of your socioeconomic background or your ethnic background, every child can have the best start. And one of the things that Marmot highlighted he coined a new phrase, it's called proportionate universalism. Um, and I was worried, is this too technical? I'm, I'm very embarrassed, I speak no Greek, I speak no Turkish, I'm many things, I'm not a linguist. So I'm aware English isn't your first language and I'm throwing in a concept here. But I want to take a moment because the idea of it is so important. It's the idea if we individually and as uh, healthcare professionals or midwives or the charitable sector want to improve outcomes and also reduce inequalities, this approach is a way to go. So you create something for everybody, you take an approach or a, a service for everybody, but you make sure that it's particularly relevant for families who need it the most. Proportionate, so you get more intensity if you need it more, but for everybody. And that idea from 2010, it informed the thinking behind Baby Buddy, the funding bids, the development. And although Baby Buddy wasn't launched till 2014, it was grounded in this proportionate universalism. So I come back to this slide as, but with this extra layer of information that the Baby Buddy phone app and the web app is there for all parents. And we, I feel, as individuals, frontline professionals, community workers, have an opportunity to make sure that more parents who maybe don't normally access reliable information, who maybe wouldn't be reading books and books, can access bite-sized bits of evidence-based information. Um, 
I had to put up this slide. There were so many photos capturing the journey we've been on, working collaboratively with our colleagues in, in, in Cyprus and Greece and Germany to bring you Baby Buddy Cyprus. And it's been knowledge transfer. We've shared what's gone well, what we've learned, some of our challenges, and the approach that's been taken with the, the rigor and the Delphi studies um, has informed our thinking and also I don't know if Nicholas has mentioned this, but we're moving towards creating Baby Buddy Australia. And we've been collaborating and the, the Australians funded by the federal government of Australia are looking to Cyprus and looking to what you've been doing. So um, I'm just keeping a little eye on time. I want to tell you the story behind because I think it's just maybe this introspective place I've been in, but sometimes when you know where someone's come from, it helps you understand their drive and their motivation to make a difference. Um, and also it might make you take stock about your journey, what made you choose to become a midwife, how you're feeling about the role now and the vital role you play day in, day out. So I'm a scientist by background. Um, I went on to do a master's in neuroscience, really understood early brain development from, I was doing that back in 94 and did some uh, research and then actually left academia to uh, become a filmmaker, a science filmmaker, making science documentaries at the BBC. And it was a brilliant job. Job, uh, flying around the world, capturing complex information and making it into little films or longer films to share and to um, increase knowledge uh, across the country um, and beyond. Um, but life is a journey and my journey took a swerve because of a few life events. Um, the first two of which were the births of my two boys, now strapping teenagers and I'm proud to say doing very well. David Topright is now a medical student but you wouldn't have guessed that he would have got there. He was born early, he was born poorly, he uh, sick. Um, he had Pierre Aubin, um, feeding and breathing difficulties um, and couldn't breastfeed. I had wanted to breastfeed because I understood the benefits. So I expressed my breast milk for England. Uh, well, for my babies in the local milk bank, at least. Um, and um, that was a challenge and a journey with operations and the Great Ormond Street Hospital. And then my second son, Josh, was born uh, just over two years later. And he also had those challenges with the cleft, but also had meningitis. Um, so here was I, an educated mom, confident, married, you just saw him earlier, to a paediatrician and it was still overwhelming. And that's, got, that's when I realized I have all this support network. I have all this uh, family and, and friends and I seek information when I need it. How much harder it would have been if I didn't have access to that. And that got me thinking. And while I was at the BBC, I was involved in this big change program. Uh, all around driving change. And I saw the parallels between the BBC and the NHS. And I began to think about what we could do to really shift things. Because on that journey, I became aware of the inequalities in outcomes. So I then founded the charity to do what I'm doing. But the reality, and this is my reflection, and maybe it's something about um, taking stock, I didn't, I didn't, found the charity. I didn't create Best Beginnings only because of my boys and their challenges or because of my knowledge at the BBC, but it was because of one person. He was pivotal and I set up the charity in his memory. His name was Professor David Baum and he was my uncle and he was inspirational and he used to tell me and my cousins a story. And I, at the end of my talk, will tell you the story that my uncle told us because I think, I hope it will have resonance for you as midwives. But onwards and upwards um, to the journey that we're on at Best Beginnings, creating interventions collaboratively, integrating them into care pathways, and then learning along the way. Um, because of the co-creation, because of the input from hundreds of frontline professionals and representatives from all these different royal colleges. Baby Buddy is formally endorsed and is NHS approved. And I want to take my 
I don't know if you know this expression, take my hat off. I want to acknowledge the extraordinary equivalent work that's been happening with Cyprus to take all of those hundreds of pieces of film and content and bespoke them, uh, add new ones and translate them so they support Cypriot families. And um, I wanted to share with you this core idea that interventions are powerful. The baby buddy web app is powerful, but it's not a magic wand. It's about how we use it. We've been out on the street, Birth Forward have pulled together this event. Today is a moment on a journey where we can all be champions of a resource which can inform and empower parents day and night with reliable information and that you can use during your contact points with parents. In making Baby Buddy Cy Cyprus, um, so much thought and energy has gone into ensuring that it delivers to the Cypriot environment and needs. Um, and midwives, I've focused on midwives just because you're such vital pieces of the maternity journey. Um, every woman um, uh, globally should have access to midwives and we know to the, de to the detriment of outcomes when there isn't solid uh, midwifery care that's fully respected by the whole of the health system. Um, there are lots of evaluations of baby buddy. Um, this is just one. We've got ones that independent ones showing an increase in breastfeeding. We've got ones showing how baby buddy can support bonding and attunement. But I wanted to show you this evaluation, which showed that using baby buddy increases something called patient activation. Uh, you could call it confidence, you could call it self-efficacy, but it's this idea that the maternity journey is so much more about a safe birth, about a baby born, the mum alive, uh, uh, reduction in stillbirth, reduction in neonatal death, reduction in maternal death. Those things are vital. And actually the funding we've got from Australia is to, in, to create Baby Buddy Australia with a focus on supporting a reduction of stillbirth. And the maternity journey and the relationship you have with parents can support the life course from a health perspective of that whole family. Uh, by showing films, by highlighting information, you can support parents to gain more confidence about their health and what they can do to look after it, and also to help them ma maximize their baby's development as well. So um, I, I come back to this as well as, not instead of. It's here, it's a, it's a tool, but it's only as good as how it's used. Um, and now you have Baby Buddy Cyprus, um, and I know other countries are looking on, um, wishing they had a version two and other conversations are underway, but you guys are the trailblazers. Um, I don't know how many of you know about this. It's called the Nurturing Care Framework. We don't need to go into it in a lot of detail today. You might want to go and look at it, but it came out from WHO and the World Bank and UNICEF, and it looks at how you can help children not just survive, but thrive. And it focuses on the early years, and it focuses on what they call the components of nurturing care. It came out a couple of years ago. I was at its launch at a conference in Bonn. I was talking about Baby Buddy, and I loved it. It originally came from a Lancet series. Um, and what it highlights is that often we focus on one thing. We might focus on breastfeeding or we might focus on uh, the, um, the, the, the birth weight, um, the, 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 the mother's level of obesity, or we might focus on responsive caregiving, you know, bonding and attunement and brain development. Or we might, there might be other charities or other work focused on safety, whether that's about reducing smoking during pregnancy or domestic abuse. What the Nurturing Care Framework highlights is that all of these things are important. And what we're proud about in terms of what we have for you and the parents you support in Baby Buddy is content that covers all aspects of nurturing care. Um, we know how many films are in Baby Buddy. And I think during the day in the workshop, you've been looking at them. Um, and amongst them are these films specifically designed to support the reduction of neonatal death, maternal death, um, and, um, and stillbirth. Um, so it's a journey that we are on together. Cyprus is now a key part of the Best Beginnings family. And we are as keen to learn from you as I know there's been learning in terms of 
how we got to where we have so far in the UK. So I encourage you to look at all the films, not just the ones that are directly about preparing for birth or uh, types of birth or pain relief in birth, but to think beyond, think uh, and embrace uh, your role as midwives, as game changers for families. Um, and COVID has really shown a sharp focus on this in the UK, the impact of COVID on maternal mental health and our, our data, which I'll share with you now, highlights that it has a role to play as much around maternal mental health as physical health. Um, I'm going to whisk through these slides now on data, but I can share them with you after. I just do want to make sure I have time at the end to tell you the story that my uncle David used to always tell me. This data is as of March. This week, we've just gone over 300,000. So 300,000 registered users of, of Baby Buddy in the UK. Um, and do you remember I took a bit of time to talk about proportionate universalism? That baby buddy is for everybody, but that it should be particularly relevant and engaging and used by families whose children have an increased risk of poor outcomes. And that increased risk is often because they're not heard, they're not listened to, their needs aren't met by the system. Um, Aral in his talk was talking about that aspect in terms of young parents, how their needs are not always met. There isn't an understanding of need and listening. I think that's absolutely the case and it's here in the UK. Assumptions are made. Um, and we worked actively to ensure that the baby buddy resource would be used by communities who need more support and are often under supported. And we did that in the simplest of ways by working with them to develop it. It wasn't us in our office, it was focus groups and workshops and we now have a really active parent panel. And what we see is that Baby Buddy is used in the UK by families of all backgrounds, but it's just used more by the families who need it the most. And in reality, a lot of that is because it's frontline professionals, including midwives like yourself, that introduce the resource to those families. So it's about active encouragement and showing it alongside a, a, a mum or a dad or a family, rather than just saying, giving a leaflet and handing it out. And in areas where the frontline professionals really use it actively with the parents, we have places, it varies month to month, but where more than half of the mums, all the mums in that year, if you look at the whole birth cohort for that year, more than half the mums are using baby buddy. I would be so delighted if Cyprus beats us because then that will raise the game in the UK. This is a resource for all pregnant families across Cyprus. Um, and the great thing is it's not just more used by mums from um, black and Asian and minority ethnic groups. And for those whose English isn't their first language, they don't just register with it more, they use it more. And it's because of the films and the simple language and the fact that it's accessible. Um, a few weeks ago, in collaboration with two charities, uh, Homestart and the Parent Infant Foundation, we published a report highlighting the challenges that COVID is creating for families and how it's widening the gap. The inequalities are, are being worsened. The families who are already experiencing inequalities are being hit harder. I think Cyprus um, is, uh, it, we're, each country has its own COVID journey, but what you have and other countries don't have is a version of an app that is yours for your communities that parents can uh, benefit from, even if there are points when you can't do face-to-face -face visits. Um, and I'll share the slide after, but we've done a lot of mapping, looking at how the app actively supports perinatal well-being, supports maternal mental health and family mental health. Um, and we know that during the pandemic in the UK, we had 104 days of what we call core lockdown. And during that period, on average, 85 percent of our mums from those more those seldom heard communities used the app on average more than once a day. So it's there to support and amplify, to add to 
uh, the great work you do with families. And we know that when Baby Buddy is used, parents uh, find it valuable. They tell us it helps them look after their mental health. They tell us it helps them look after their physical health. It, we, they tell us it helps them looking after their baby. And importantly, and the last one is worth being aware of, it's helping them get more out of appointments. So by you embracing this uh, app and using it with families, it will support your contact points with them. Um, and um, we have so much evidence from parents and professionals around that. But um, I've got uh, three minutes on the clock till formally um, my 30 minutes is up. So I will um, leave you with these quotes briefly. And then I'll tell you the story that my uncle used to always tell me. Because I think it's pertinent now that baby buddy has come to Cyprus. So the story of my uncle um, was, and you may have heard it told by different people in different ways. I don't believe it was his story, but from when I was a young child, he would tell it to us. There's an old man who used to go for a walk along a beach, cliff top, uh, the, the top of a beach. I don't know whether you might recognize this one or not. Um, he didn't have great vision, to be honest, I'm now thinking to my father. So that's why you can justify the um, slightly blurry images. Um, and it's always deserted. Every evening he'd go for this walk and the beach was empty. But one day he saw some activity and it caught his eye and he started walking nearer to the beach. And he realized there was a boy there. It could be a girl. Let's say, I'll tell it as my uncle told it. There was a boy there really busy only one boy and he couldn't see what else was going on and he walked closer and closer he was now on the beach walking towards the water's edge and the boy didn't notice him because the boy was really busy and then the old man looked down and he saw hundreds of starfish on the beach drying and dying on the sand and he saw the boy was picking up starfish and throwing them back into the water. But for everyone he was throwing back in, others were being washed onto the shore. And this was an old man. He felt he was a wise old man. And he wanted to tell the boy that what he was doing was pointless. What is the point of throwing one in if another two or three or four are washing onto, onto the shore? So he went alongside the boy. He's standing next to the boy. The boy is so busy doing his activity, he doesn't notice until the old man speaks. The old man turns to the boy and he says, young man, and the young man looks up. What you were doing makes no sense. Can't you see you're not making any difference here? And the young man looks up to the old man. The boy looks up to the old man. And he says, well, sir, and he bends down and he picks up a starfish and he says, it makes a difference to this one. For me, that story led me to leave the BBC and set up Best Beginnings. I could have hidden under the duvet with the challenges I had with my kids and they were serious and they were ongoing. But it inspired me to realize that while the problems of the world can feel insurmountable, and I would say now with the pandemic, it can at times feel overwhelming for everybody. It's easy to take a, a route of there's no point. What can we do? What difference we can make? Well, the starfish story to me always resonates with midwives because in your day to day job, you have the honor and the privilege. And I think this is why I love midwives so much to make a difference to people's lives. Um, and all we're doing through uh, Baby Buddy Forward, through this collaboration with Cyprus, is to gift you through our collaborative endeavor, Baby Buddy Cyprus, for you to have as a tool in the vital work you do with families day in, day out. Thank you very much. Um, can somebody switch on the light? <laughs>
My goodness, thank you very much, Alison. Um, that story, I heard it before, and every time I hear it, it gets better and better, especially with the, uh, with the visual. Thank you very much for this uh, inspirational uh, talk. Uh, I'm, I have a couple of points here that I wanted to make. We started this morning by telling our audience here about universal proportionalism yes. and how baby body Cyprus is there now for everyone, but we wanted to reach the people that probably would make more of a difference, that needed more, that don't have the same opportunity as uh, everybody else to look in books, to find valid sources on the internet, the confidence to talk to their health professionals. So far, we are uh, six months into launching, silently launching Baby Buddy over a COVID pandemic. And it's great to see how we have already reached 1,700 users, which is a very significant number for a birth cohort of 10,000 uh, births a year. We're not doing great though, in terms of reaching the ones who need it more. As I was showing some stats this morning from the platform, 80% of our users are university graduates, whereas the national statistics would put it around 50, 55%. So we need to do more work so that uh, baby body is out there for everyone, but it's proportionally more used by the people who have less access to other means of information. The second point I note down from your speech is the idea of getting more out of an appointment. I wrote it down because that was the core, I'd say, to our workshop this morning. The idea that traditionally we have the educational, um, uh, the structure, um, education in the antenatal classes, the preparation for, for birth, but what about all those moments, all those moments, every contact, making every contact count? So we explore a little bit this morning, why don't we do that more? What are the barriers? Is there anything that would make it easier? Is it, um, what will make um, that moment count? Um, and, I'm glad you mentioned UCL and the COM-B model because this is what we try to structure um, our thinking around those two, three aspects. And at the end of this session, um, we're gonna gather all these ideas, what our um, participants have been telling us and try and make a quick diagnosis. Is it our capability? Is it the opportunity that the system affords? Is it um, a matter of motivation? And what would motivate us to do that more? So thank you for bringing that idea up about getting more out of appointments and how baby buddy can do that. Uh, so because it provides a structure for the conversation, because it provides a starting point for the, the health professional, because it, it, through video and through, uh, text, short bits of information in simple language, you can actually engage yeah. with uh, um, people. I'm going to call Veronica to the stage. Um, I actually, I don't even know why I started speaking because I told Veronica after this, you have to thank our speakers. You're, much, you're, you're doing much better than me <laughs> in, in expressing uh, gratitude. Um, so there's Veronica. Um, yeah, as she sits thanks. down, uh, or as she speaks, Veronica, uh, for, for this presentation here today. As you um, see, with can, can you hear? Can I can I just quickly say, I just wanted to introduce Nelushka to us because she's joined from Best Beginnings. I just wanted to make sure that people knew who Nilu was, who joined us on the, on, on the, on the screen. Nilu is our um, head of evaluation and impact, and she is only one of a team of people. But I just wanted her to be here, to be part of this. And if we have go into a Q&A session, she's here as well.
Sorry to interrupt you, Veronica. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, all, as, as Nico summarized it nicely already, I'm not going to pick up, but I want to contribute. We had at the same time a workshop with stakeholders that work in a different part of our community. And um, we were we're talking a lot about um, networking, that we need to do this together, um, and, uh, and, and who, who to connect with. And we were also talking about empowerment and um, empowerment. What the, the, the things that keep pick it, uh, picking up uh, on that subject is relationships. So um, relationship counts, personal relationship counts. So the personal contact is, is so, so important. So um, we can only enhance this really with, we have a tool, but as you said as well, we need the personal relationship. And, I wanted to thank you, uh, especially you, Alison, the, the, the vision. Um, we had this dream when we founded this organization to have an app, a, a, a platform for health professionals as well as parents. And then I went to this presentation, I met Nico and Orania. <laughs> and then I remember us sitting uh, in, in, uh, um, on Nico's veranda in Limassol and we were drafting this idea and we had Stalo talking about the funding that would be potential is, it's not like this thing has been over five years. So it's not something that, oh, wow, the first of all, and, and the university, they can do this. They, it's not like that. It, it was not, nothing was there. We were not even there as an organization. Um, so, um, and then it's, it's relationship and it's driven people that were inspiring. And then we found you, Alison. And then we said, wow, what can they do? <laughs> and then um, we, we got Alison on board. Um, and then uh, we wrote the grant and then we got the funding um, and then we started working with many of you here in Rome, yeah? Um, so it's um, as much as this little sea, this little starfish, um, every single one can make such a difference. So, and it's, it's, it's this coming together and motivating each other um, and, and doing it together that can really make the difference. Um, and for what I was talking about, um, can bring this respectful maternity care. I'm standing here as a mother of three children. Um, I could easily tell a similar personal story about life events that driven me here. So my background is in adult education and uh, um, I'm a VBAG mom. So that drove me to keep founding the Birth Forward organization. I'm standing here. Two days ago, my third child was born. It was um, a, a year, uh, it just turned a year. And I was remembering that this was my first out of three births that my partner and my baby was with me. All the other births, they were not allowed, they were taken away from me. And guys, it was not medical reasons, it was not. One room was too cold. They didn't know that I'm giving birth at 31st of December downstairs, so they couldn't warm up the room. They wouldn't give me my baby after birth. Things like that. It was for me personally very upsetting. My partner was sent out. So this whole thing is about, um, this is just a personal connection to how important those small things we might not think are for the woman and for the baby and the family that is giving birth. So um, this, Nikos, um, Alison, uh, and uh, everybody in this room here, that uh, Stella, Orania, Eileen, and, all, all of you have contributed so nicely. Let's, let's, let's carry that beautiful work that we have done, that we've got so far. And let's not just take those numbers, whether they are what they mean or not, every single person counts. And if it's just one, it is one already. So, um, Nico, <laughs> shall we go into questions? Yes. <laughs> So questions, anybody from the auditorium? Do we have any questions? Comments? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. We have a question coming. Hello, and actually it's not a question. Actually it's uh, just admiring to tell you that it's something wonderful doing by you. So uh, to say to all of you, as a midwife, uh, a new midwife, uh, I would like to thank you that you give us all, all this work in front of us and you give us chances to reveal our dreams to see forward. 
Uh, I, I love your stories, Alison, also about uh, Dr. Aru. Everything that you said in this audience today is marvelous. Uh, actually, as a midwife of four, four children, I have a born with normal delivery, four of them. Uh, I would like to say a big thank you to you that uh, I, I will continue to dream and dream and uh, to achieve my dreams and uh, to have all these chances from this baby body forward to be given to us as midwives to open our uh, paths, our ways to really something new. Thank you. May I, may oh, I don't have a question. <laughs> I like to notice uh, the contribution of Professor Arul have done to the team of uh, Dr. Stephen Magalhaes Hospital. We thank you, Dr. Arul. And uh, there is a change in our hospital to the positive uh, phase, let's say. And we like you to, and I like to ask you, Professor, to continue your pro uh, contribution and your advice is to our doctor's team. It's a, a lovely change to the positive point, of, let's say, of birth. And I think he can do more for us. Partnerships. Partnerships, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. I shall certainly be back after the COVID era. So we are waiting to come back. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, we've spoken about what we do now the COVID. We can't pause everything. So um, um, I think we said we need to do more webinars with networks. We need to work with you here. I don't know if uh, you, know, you know, we had online seminars of Breath Forward, which we had easily within a couple of days, hundreds of people registered. So there's a huge need. And I know a lot of um, hospitals are not doing uh, educational classes, but maybe this class is one of the workshops, I don't know. Uh, so um, we need to continue now. Especially now in the in pandemic, um, we need to continue the work because what we see here is as well a lot of things deteriorating that we already progressed. For instance, at the beginning here in Cyprus, uh, partners were not allowed at all. Oh, so we have to find creative ways to co keep, keep, keep supporting. That's good. Other, other comments or questions? I have a, 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 a couple of comments, if I may. Sure. Um, Go ahead, Alison. I first of all, wanted to uh, um, thank. I couldn't. Because the camera isn't so good from here. I couldn't see who was speaking, but it's just so lovely to see all of you in the audience and to see how you're here, despite with the social distancing. And I know I'm only seeing some of the room. But really, I want to thank you, and I, and I, I always, I, I go to a lot of conferences, and no disrespect to my obstetric colleagues, um, Errol, but I particularly love attending midwifery conferences because there is something very precious about the roles you do day in, day out. And then to the second point, what I wanted to say is, you, it's fantastic that you have Errol. He was an incredible champion in the UK. He did a brilliant job as the president of the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in the UK. And I think it's fantastic that he's championing um, this respectful care and supporting collaboration. In the UK, there sometimes the, the relationship and the dynamic between um, obstetricians and midwives is not perfect but sometimes when it is the, the stronger that relationship is the better the care is for the families the better the care is um, for the, the, the mother the child and, and the better working environment it is for everybody um, and actually a lot of the work we've been doing in the UK the last several years I've been lucky enough to be on this thing called the maternity transformation program and at the heart of that is um, is work bringing together collaboratively work of obstetricians and, and midwives. And I guess on behalf of Best Beginnings, if there's anything we can do, if you ever want us to come and talk to obstetricians to, to discuss this work, um, we're here for you. I understand your health system is different. I understand there are different um, challenges and the context is different, but at the heart of it, we want to work together to maximize outcomes and empower parents and reduce inequalities. So um, 
Well, it's brilliant that Harold is here as your champion. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I have a question following uh, this, and it goes to you, uh, Ru. Um, again, Alison brought up one of the ideas we've been, we've been exploring a little bit earlier about interprofessional collaboration and when midwives work together with doctors, um, we do better. So when we're exploring the barriers using our Com B model, one of the interesting ideas, and may I say, I still haven't shown the results of this workshop to everyone yet, but one of the interesting things that came out was exactly that, how in the lack of good communication between midwives and doctors, if there is no interprofessional collaboration, um, one of the participants in the workshop was explaining that a midwife might even refrain from taking a more active role uh, in terms of counseling so she might not a midwife might choose not to engage in this educational role to make every contact count because there might be the fear that what she says might come in conflict with what the doctor would say especially in a culture uh, um, such as cyprus where there might be uh, more trust in the doctor, less trust in the midwife, the fear alone that there might be conflict in, and the dilemma, I guess, that they, that would cause professional um, um, conflict. So we haven't explored this idea fully yet. It was just one comment made by one participant I wanted to bring to the attention of everyone. But let's say that that's a problem. Uh, what suggestions would you have for us to go over the problem? How do we um, strengthen the interprofessional collaboration? Do you want me to go first, Errol, and then you or you first? I don't mind. Well, you carry on and then I'll tell my experiences, yeah. Okay, so um, this idea at the heart of it, I believe Baby Buddy could play a more powerful role than you might expect. Um, there's a wonderful, uh, actually, he's a pediatrician who worked with my uncle. He is now, I don't know how many years ago he should have retired. His name is Sir Cyril Chandler, and he is the uh, co-chair of the Maternity Transformation Programme in the UK. And he coined a phrase, and it went into our policy document, which is called Better Births. And he says, if you learn, oh my gosh, my, I, I've had COVID and I have slight COVID brain, so I might say it not quite right, but it's something like if you, um, you work better together when you learn together, well, that's the essence of it. And this is true. Rather than separate training for midwives and separate training for obstetricians or the same with health visitors. In the UK, we have some challenges in terms of the support of parents and the interplay between the role of the midwife and the role of the health visitor. Well, what we have found, and it's come out loud and clear from qualitative research, um, quite a lot of it, and insight work, um, and actually it's written up in a couple of, um, of academic papers, is actually the process of exploring the content in Baby Buddy and thinking about how you're going to use it in contact points. If you do that work, with multidisciplinary colleagues, a few things happen. First of all, you're in the room together, whereas often that doesn't happen. So uh, if we look in the UK, it's often between midwives and health visitors. You actually, by doing a co-creation workshop about how to use it together, suddenly that's someone with a name and a face and a story, and it's the relational piece. Secondly, you begin to think, gosh, well, if you as a midwife said this, and I as a health visitor, as an obstetrician, I could reinforce that message. And it suddenly becomes a team game, how collectively you are using the resource for the benefit of the family. But the benefit, I wouldn't say it's an unintended consequence because we've been doing it in quite a purposeful way in the UK, but a, a, a additional benefit is it brings multidisciplinary colleagues together to actually discuss and agree decisions and pathways. We've done this a lot around perinatal mental health. Some of the discussions that have flowed when embedding baby buddy within a, a locality 
through the lens of perinatal mental health is identifying gaps in referral pathways. So the benefits of doing the learning together, I would say will go well beyond uh, the benefits for the mum, but it will actually, I hope, uh, Cyprus become ever more connected in terms of the midwifery and the obstetric routes. Well, just for me to comment, actually, the, the working uh, at the top level sometimes is very good. That is the Association of Advice and the Association of Obstetricians and Gynecologists. Over the years, I have been visiting Cyprus. Um, whenever I organized with the colleagues in Cyprus symposiums at Makarios Hospital, the opening remarks are given by the president of the midwife, president of the ONG, president of the pediatrics. So in other words, they all participate and the speakers also selected. So there is an obstetrician, pediatrician and a midwife. So all the seminars at Makarios, which we did was a collaboration of the ONG Society, the Pediatric Association, the Midwifery Association and the Perinatal Society. And we purposely have separate seminars for specific areas like operating delivery, for example, that's for obstetrician, but if it is fetal monitoring, then it's for all. So I think as Alison mentioned, learning together is quite important. So they, they are saying the same thing when they meet a patient or whatever it is, or case discussion, they should sit together. The, the second aspect is actually, in addition to this learning environment, they must also meet together whenever there's a problem. By talking to each other, then they will dissolve the problem. You can have, if they're in a hospital, if the environment is not good, you must create champions on the obstetric side and the midwifery side so they can talk. And they are the spokesmen or advocates for each side and they can resolve the problem. In the UK, it has come to a good point in the sense I'm, a, of course, an honorary midwife. I'm a fellow of the midwifery college. So uh, because of my close association with them, now the College of Midwives are situated within the building of the Royal College of Obstetricians in the new building. So they can just pop out of the door and talk to each other and resolve the problem. So discussion, common problems like uh, Baby buddy, if you have a symposium, having them as well and talk through the various aspects of it, then the AI is clear so they can work together. Because the person who is going to benefit out of close relationship is the woman and the child. So I think if they fight, what suffers is the health and well being of the woman and the child. So I think it's a good point you raised, but I think it needs more effort, more effort, more effort, good communication, closer communication, more frequent communication. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have a, um, a comment from the audience. Yeah. Um, I mean, I agree with both Alison and Aru that uh, we need to- Let me say that, you're listening to uh, Urania Kolokotroni speech. Yeah, that uh, we need to strengthen the relationships between uh, the midwives and the obstetricians. And I think because some of us were in academia as well, I think we need to start earlier and start when they're students in their uh, at the university and start within the professional learning then. Um, and I think in that respect, they start to learn the roles of each other, start to understand their, role, their roles of each other and they start to respect what each one of them is doing. So I think we need to start earlier, not just leave it after they qualify and they're working uh, practitioners, but when they're students. And um, I think the dynamics there are a bit different as well but they start to understand and learn from each other. I think that, uh, uh, that's another way forward. Yeah. I agree, completely agree. Thank you, Rania, for this uh, comment. Um, I know at the University of Nicosia, you've started exploring a lot of ways for interprofessional learning and how to bring people the earliest, the sooner the better, together while they're still students. May I add to this that there's two aspects of interprofessional learning. There is also interprofessional teaching. So I think we should see more of that, like gynecologists and obstetricians teach midwifery students. I think we should see more midwives talking to uh, prospective um, um, uh, doctors. Uh, there needs to be more interprofessional uh, teaching as well within our uh, within um, academia. It's not always bi-directional though. Um, so is there any 
more questions or comments? I'm wondering whether everybody's looking at the time. We had a very busy day. Yeah. We practically didn't even give people their 15 minute coffee break because we had to move from room to room to go from the plenary sessions to the workshops and, and, and back. Um, we have one more comment coming from the audience. Again, it's a comment. Every time I have been in a conference like this today and listening to all ideal, uh, let's say, midwifery outcomes, I think we have to do every year more conference, not only online, the new conduct. So maybe it's an idea, all the organization participate in this baby body platform to organize, uh, not once in a year, maybe more often, yeah, conference like this, we can do it even in COVID time, and to get in contact also with uh, so many professors from the abroad, because this conference motivates us to go forward and to go yeah, we have this day. We have regular meetings as we're forward. Because have we don't have enough in midwifery in Veronica, yeah. let's say. And so so some fine. of our members, they say, I, I need my first forward dose again. <laughs> I need my dose of, of motivation again. And it's, um, it's, I think the next step would be, and this is an open invitation. You have no who to talk to in your hospital. So please, uh, email me, contact me, uh, write me an email, write Nikos an email. My name is Veronica with a K, right forward, dot com, or write and contact us how you registered here. We could run workshops in the, I think it would be nice if we go into the hospitals the next step, do smaller workshops with interdisciplinary teams, the teams in your hospitals. I actually already shake hands with the director of Marcario Hospital and he was very positive on that idea. So, but it, it, it is you and the hospitals that make it happen. If you invite us, we come, we, we run with you one and a half, two hour workshops, but we need to, you need to help us here. So um, we can only do that together because we don't know who to talk to, where to, and so forth. So if you can help us, we are happy, Nikos or Ania, I think um, this, I can speak in, in the name of the team. <laughs> oh, you always look at me like this. <laughs> but, um, um, yeah, I think um, it, um, we need to do that together. So don't wait to be invited. Please take initiative. Thank you, Veronica. So before closing, allow me just one last uh, comment. I'm taking the work co-creation that Alison was talking about. And I'm, I'm taking the collaboration at the top level that Arul was talking about. And we had a, it was such um, an, a joy and privilege in the last year and a half collaborating with the professional associations, the scientific associations over here in, in, in Cyprus with the midwives, the gynecologists, the pediatricians, the neonatal um, society. Uh, at the top level, in co-creation workshops, so that we can get to agree of what the content of Baby Body would be on the topics that we were developing and what the, the videos uh, should be about and what are the five key messages we want to include because we don't want the videos to be longer than two minutes. And I'd say that was extremely powerful and it was very nice to see how the, the uh, four uh, relevant professional associations in Cyprus because of this project, because of this agent-led project led by the university and an NGO came together to actually uh, discuss, co-create, agree on messages. These co-creation workshops are very powerful. And I'm thinking again, the comment that the participant made earlier in the workshop um, about how do we do that more um, and more often, we spoke now about conferences, more need for seminars, for symposiums. Well, one idea would be that this should happen more often within the hospitals, within interprofessional teams that come together to co-create, to sit down and write um, half a page with key messages about a topic. Um, we found that that collaboration was very powerful 
brought people together, brought people to discuss things that perhaps they were not even discussed before. We, we even made material on, 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 on VBAC with the agreement of the, um, um, uh, society, of the professional associations. I think that's a start, but it shouldn't stay at the top level. I think it should drip down so that everybody gets together to, um, um, to collaborate. And a co-creation workshop might just be the, the start. I already mentioned to everybody earlier, um, there was a question whether that's it, baby buddy is static, that's the material, uh, or would there be more? Well, of course, that's not the material. And I informed everyone that, like in the UK, we, Baby Buddy Cyprus team, will soon send invitations out to their professional associations to invite them to participate in our scientific uh, board, our editorial board, like they have been during the three year process, but we want that to stay permanent. We want it to be there because material would need to change new materials should be added. So there is a lot of value in, in discussing and continuing co-creating material and suggestions coming our way of uh, new material that can be included in the platform. Not just to provide um, families with more information, that's one aspect of it, but also to um, strengthen collaboration more so that we can continue through these uh, workshops to keep on talking. Thank you um, very much uh, to both our keynote speakers. It's such a, a privilege to have you both uh, here address our uh, uh, conference uh, this morning. Uh, unfortunately, we were imagining somewhat different back in March it was going to be a whole day with plenty of opportunity for people to get together and in workshops. Uh, unfortunately, due to um, the uh, circumstances, we had to shorten the time, keep it only in the morning, uh, have you only participating online. Uh, it, it worked out nicely, I'd say, in the end. We managed to overcome a lot of technical issues we had along the way. So uh, um, thank you very much. And I'm really hoping that this, um, it'd be very soon before we meet in person. Thank you very much. Thank you. You, uh, you can't see me smiling because of the mask, but there is a smile. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, I'd, li I'd like to say thank you as well. And it's also a pleasure to be here with Aaron because it's been a long time since we've seen him. And I do look forward to coming when COVID allows to meet as many of you, maybe at one of those upcoming co-creation workshops, multidisciplinary ones. But in the meantime, just thank you for having um, us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Valdico, with such a nice, beautiful closure, I was going to take care of switch on the Facebook Live, please. Oh, uh, I don't know how to do any of those things. Okay, you have to come here and do it for me. All right, so we're closing now the online right. audience. Yes? Okay. Okay, I'll, we will let you guys go. Thank you very much. Have a nice okay. afternoon. Have a nice day. And we have uh -huh. to have to do the house. And Yoli will deal with all the technical. <laughs>